Ready? Everybody, welcome to day one of Augmented World Expo 2022. Come on! Woo! Give yourselves a hand. This is the event to be at. So welcome to the Grand Ballroom B, in case you, you didn't know, you're in B. It's a very exciting letter. Um, and today, uh, this session is all dedicated to retail, e-commerce, and advertising. My name is Lori H. Schwartz. I'm going to be your cruise director today. Um, and I'm a bit of a trendmeister, always looking at the latest trends in media and tech. And so I'm so excited to host today and to be around all these uh, people who are really leading the charge in this space and really monetizing with great solutions how we move through all this with this great technology. So let me just do some uh, housekeeping for you guys. First of all, um, if you don't know, awe.live is a fantastic app that has the schedule has anything streaming if you need it. It's where all the great information about everything happening today is. We have a special event today. We have a welcome reception, which is sponsored by Zapier, and that's at the Hyatt Pool at 6 p.m., so you don't want to miss that. And then we're also going to have a coffee break, free coffee, free coffee, ladies and gentlemen, please. Is that the greatest thing in the world? Uh, I know, right? Free coffee, thank you, and you and I are hanging out later. Uh, free coffee in the Mission City Lobby at 1020. And then just really quickly, we have some great events tomorrow. The expo floor is going to open. Oh my god, the biggest expo floor. Really exciting companies demonstrating things. Um, it's, it's a great time. We're back from the pandemic, and all these great companies have come to showcase their stuff. So definitely make sure you hang out at the expo. We're going to have a happy hour tomorrow as well, um, uh, sponsored by Vario. Um, that's at 5.30 tomorrow. And of course, the Augie Awards. Do we have any Augie award winners in the audience right now? All right, we do. Oh my God, you're my best friend has already won an Augie? Okay, see I have really good taste. All right, and we also um, have some other special events like the after party tomorrow by TikTok. Um, there's going to be food available at the uh, Hyatt to purchase. Also, anything you're posting, we love for you to participate and share everything that you're getting exposed to. So hashtag AWE2022, of course. Everything's going to be recorded, so if you missed anything, you can go on to the app and check it out. The Wi-Fi here um, is AWE underbar Wi-Fi, and the password is all small letters, welcome, exclamation point. Um, I mean, they wouldn't say unwelcome, exclamation point, right? They'd say... Welcome. All right. Um, you didn't laugh either, so what are you? I'm depending on you. <laughs> All right. For, I want to take a moment also to thank our sponsors. Uh, our sponsors are really who make everything happen. A special thank you to Avatar. They're going to be speaking today. They are today's sponsor for this room, and you're going to be hearing from them, and they are quite amazing. But we'd also like to thank our gold sponsors for their support, and that is Arbor XR, Hololite, HP, Meta, Niantic, Care AR, Metadome, Snap, TikTok, Soar, and Meta Materials. So let's have a hand for those sponsors. They are making the magic happen. Um, and then an extra, extra big thank you to our Titanium sponsors. Again, Avatar, Magic Leap, Qualcomm, and Unity Technologies. You're going to be hearing from all these fantastic companies today. And look, this is interactive all day long. So if you have questions, just come up to the mic. Um, this panel would love for you to ask questions throughout the panel. So don't be shy. I'll also be running around with a mic. So please raise your hand if you have a question to ask, and we'll try and organically get in there but we want you to really participate. And without further ado now, I want to introduce this panel. It's so important to understand what are the services that we're delivering in XR. And user research is really the key to all of this. You know, how do we help build a product that is relevant, that meets the needs of all of our various consumers? And there are so many different needs. So we're going to really dig into it with this panel and set the stage for all the great conversations that we're going to have today. So it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce the moderator, Danny Carson, who is the senior director and head of user research at a company you probably haven't heard of called Magic Leap. Magic Leap, you hear? Okay, there you go. You, you gave me a little love there. Um, so Danny is going to introduce and moderate this panel. So let's have a big hand for everybody and for yourselves for coming out today. Thank you.
I think that was a better introduction than I could have given. So, you know, if you feel free to come back up. Um, yeah, as she mentioned, it, the, the, this space is so new and it's such in its infancy that the research that supports it is, is just the same. There's so much that um, is unexplored territory in this space. I know when I first came into the industry, uh, the analogy that we heard a lot was that we were building a plane and flying it at the same time, and, and it's still uh, true today, especially in areas uh, like behavioral science, neuroscience, psychology. And so this group that we have today is, is very well-rounded in a number of different areas within this space. So I think we're going to have uh, the ability to have some, some great conversation. And just to re reiterate, there's microphones out there, one right here. The uh, format of this is, is very uh, collaborative. Uh, we'd like this to be a discussion, so you don't need to wait till the end for questions or, or anything like that. So without further ado, uh, why don't you guys go ahead. We'll start at the end. Go ahead and introduce yourself, and we'll get going. Should I stand up? <laughs> Actually, uh, it's a very crowded stage today. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Yan Shu, and I am a UX research scientist from Meta Reality Labs Research. Uh, my current interest is in the input and output for the XR interactions, especially leveraging AI in this type of interactions. And um, I'm excited to see you all. And my background is in human-computer interactions, so any questions uh, along that line, um, I'm excited to hear about it. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, folks. My name is Tom Gable, a senior researcher at Microsoft. Uh, I work on human input and interaction, uh, hardware experience, and a lot on accessibility across the XR space. Uh, I come from a psychology background and engineering psychology, human factors sort of work. Uh, yeah, so excited to talk to you. Hey, everyone. I'm uh, Joelle Zimmerman, uh, lead scientist, um, lead behavioral scientist at Magic Leap. I have a background in psychology and neuroscience, and I'm excited to be here with you guys today. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jim Bai. I'm a system professor from University of Rochester. Uh, my background in human-computer interaction, um, augmented reality, conversational agent. So um, in my lab, we build technologies to help uh, people with various ability and background uh, to better learn and to better communicate. Very glad to be on this stage and look forward to have the conversation. Hi, everybody. I'm Marina. Um, I am a principal um, research manager at Microsoft. Uh, I've been working on HoloLens for a long time. Uh, my background is in neuroscience, so my part of my specific interest is around how uh, human brains, uh, brains process information in uh, augmented reality. Uh, and I'm super excited to be here today. Thank you. Hello, I'm Travis Bowles. I'm from Meta. I'm a user research manager at Meta, specializing in augmented reality hardware. Prior to that, I worked on software for HoloLens experiences. My background is experimental psychology with a specialization in human factors. And I am also very excited to talk to these folks. Okay, so kicking things off, kind of a softball question that, uh, that could lead to some discussion, but uh, as we embark on this and we need to understand users and, and how they learn and they develop and how they experience uh, this technology, uh, what does it mean to you with, with the, the various different specialties and backgrounds that we have on the team, the focus is on hardware versus interactions and experiences, um, what is it that, um, that user research sort of means to you and, and is driving the work that you're doing? Travis, why don't you kick us off? I think what's really interesting about this space is that uh, we are, because we are dealing with devices, slight bias towards hardware here. Um, we have to consider not just the experiences, usability, whether or not we're building something people need, but also building something that people can use across a range of physical sizes, shapes, characteristics. We think about that as user researchers, but the thing sometimes it slips out of our purview and out of our, our sight is environment. And when you talk about augmented reality, mixed reality experiences, that environment side of things also comes in. Combine all that together, and we have really interesting cross-disciplinary problems. I'll jump in. I think building off what uh, Travis just said, um, kind of this merging of the digital and physical, that's what's different in uh, user research in XR, and that's why I think multidisciplinary collaboration is so important. 
when you think about all of the environmental variables that come in, um, you're no longer just dealing with like the visual system, you're also dealing with um, ergonomics, human factors, um, audio, how people interact with others in this totally new space. So it's not just you, it might be a multi-user experience. Um, so all that put together um, is why I think you need people from many different backgrounds. To build up, <laughs> build up what Joe has already mentioned, I think it's super critical to realize that, that we are a community here, building it together. So we're creating the platforms, we're creating the ecosystem, we're creating a, a place for all the different developers and uh, creators to come in and then make their most innovative uh, uh, innovations on this in the space. So uh, the sense of community and fostering the community to grow is another really important part of the UX. I think um, to add to a just maybe slightly different direction too, but the thing that's really cool and interesting about being the user researcher in this space is that there's so many unknowns. We're still, as Danny said earlier, building this plane as we're flying it, and there's so many new questions. Nobody's done this before, so every time you answer a question, you generally end up finding more, more questions to answer after it, and um, that's just really exciting because you never know what your day is going to be like. Yeah, and to, to expand a bit more on that as well, the, the, the core piece of what we're all trying to build is something that people want and people need. Um, we don't want to build devices that no one buys and no one uses or experiences that don't serve a purpose. And by focusing on the user, by working with these interdisciplinary teams across ID, engineering, software, human factors, all these other groups, user researchers can focus the, the product and the, the completion of that object or experience or whatever it is towards user needs to solve user goals or pain points. And by ensuring a product does that, you have a product that is actually useful to someone that they'll buy and use over and over again. Uh, we don't want to end up with products that people just put on a shelf and say, oh, that's a cool thing, but I never use it because blank. And user research really can help with that. Uh, across all these different areas, not just software, uh, but across a spectrum of things as we learn more about the space. Yeah, I, uh, uh, to add on to that, I think the thing really interested about AR VR is that it's basically trying to extend our senses. So I think from um, like the other way around, talking about user research, it's, I think it's also a channel through which it helps us to better understand human systems. Um, you know, because we, we um, the strengths of this immersiveness and this disappearing technology to help extend and augment human abilities, to do that, it, uh, you know, forces us to better understand human, human systems and that Kind of connecting with everybody in this uh, ecosystem of research and uh, engineering work and innovation to kind of have to, to really um, look on each other's side to keep learning about technology and human um, human ability, human senses. I think that is a really exciting aspect and thrust into user-inspired technology. You know, we talk about users. What do you think about in terms of the difference between um, developers versus users? I mean, we need to interact with with both sides, you know, of that. You know, end users and people that are creating on this platform. Uh, how do you approach each in your work, um, and and how does that? How do they blend together, and how does that feed into the the larger um, design and development processes? I'll maybe kick us off here. That's a great question. Uh, so when you're working on an ecosystem or, you know, like devices and experiences and like the way that fits together, there's so many different types of users. Like there's the end user, right? The person who puts the device on or opens an app and uses it for something. There's a person who builds the content, creates the apps, that's developers. And then there's also, in addition, um, commercial customers, like enterprises that have to, you know, create the content and use it for some purpose to better their business. All of them have different needs, but if you treat them, I think that what's helpful for us in our framework is that we look at them in the same way, in a saying that this person has their goals, their needs that they're trying to accomplish. If you go 
focus on what they're trying to do and understand that and enable that, then whether the developer and their, their need is to build something versus they are an end user and their need is to get something done using the device, um, it becomes a little easier to make sure you can help them get there. Actually, uh, I've been doing uh, developer experience research recently. So um, um, what um, uh, she just has mentioned about the uh, diversity among the users and developers is a big part of it. So we do a lot of persona research archetypes between uh, different, uh, even within the subtypes of the developers. Um, we, we all come from different backgrounds with different skill sets and different uh, passion and different levels. Um, so. In, in addition to what has been traditionally researched in the developer research community, which is to uh, understand how programmers and developers, we, we need to expand the scope, that's the first thing. And then the other thing is that the traditional um, metrics of evaluating those uh, developer experiences versus like the user experiences need to it be innovated. Um, for example, a lot of the traditional programming is actually trying to get something done with a clear goal, but a lot of the programming in AR, XR is actually about exploration and creativity, and how do we actually encourage that kind of uh, creativity and uh, the, the outcome that may not be you know, wh where people started with. That's another really, really interesting uh, topic for the developer experience research. You can think of it sort of like an iceberg with the developers at like the bottom, the base. You need to support those, and that traditionally what you think of as like the end user at the very tip. But you need everything. So following up on that, when it comes to studying users and understanding their needs and how we're going to serve those, where do you draw the line between uh, a novice user with no experience in AR, um, you know, someone that that doesn't maybe have bias, but also not knowledge and familiarity with it versus someone that's much more experienced that may be able to unlock some insights um, that could drive you forward as well. Where do you differentiate between those, those groups? Yeah, I think it's a spectrum. Um, there's no like bins necessarily as understanding there's a spectrum of users um, who are going to try and uh, use this device in, the, in their lives, um, whether that's someone who's, and, and not just a spectrum of like experience with this technology, but experience with technology. Uh, HoloLens 2 is a first line worker device. Um, it's focused on people who are not always using technology in their everyday work lives. Um, we have users who are digital natives who just started in a manufacturing plant. We have people who may have been there for 30 years and have not used a device, a computer, as part of their daily job in those 30 years, and now they're being asked to. We have to create interactions. We have to create interfaces. We have to create devices that are usable across those people. And the other piece as well is to consider accessibility in all of this. Uh, at Microsoft, we look at it as an accessibility spectrum across temporary, situational, and permanent disabilities. Someone who's a first-line worker on a factory floor and has wrenches or tools in their hands, they're temporarily not air situationally disabled. They cannot use their hands. They have to have another input method if they want to interact with things. Um, and that goes across the whole spectrum. And so designing these devices like AR or VR that are meant to be used in everyday lives across situations, whether I'm walking down the street with directions in my head and walking around the conference and trying to find a room, whatever the future of this space is that we all envision it to be, we have to consider these situations where people can't use things like we use our phones or can't use other devices and, and develop that from the base to ensure we're creating devices that can be used for anyone in any situation, not just the idealistic situation. And just to add to that, in addition, even when we're trying to build something that essentially is taking something that's real in the real world and making a virtual version of that and making a, something that someone can interact with using augmented reality, we still need to be really careful when we think about what the expectations and understanding of our potential users are. One of the things that surprised me is how often people are unclear on whether people who are not wearing augmented reality devices can see the things that they are seeing. To us, that doesn't make sense because we have our relationship with the technology. But for a lot of folks, that does make sense. They don't understand how these things work. When you don't bring that kind of perspective to your designs, to your research, 
When you focus on just the folks around you who recognize the inherent coolness of what you're doing, then you really set yourself up for something that may feel like, oh, this is just something they can interact with naturally, but they may not understand the core tenets of interaction that they need to be able to be successful. Yeah, I may be uh, thinking a little bit too about the nature of doing user research in, uh, in the space and sort of some of the challenges you run into given that this is a very new technology, that differentiator between having novice users, people who have never seen augmented reality before or virtual reality before, uh, and folks who have some experience in the medium create some challenges in actually running research. So one of the things that we've noticed that's always been very um, kind of both cool to see, but also challenging when you're trying to get specific answers is that when you first put, put folks into an experience that's a uh, mixed reality experience, they just kind of like their eyes get really big, they go, whoa, and then they just kind of like mesmerized by everything. And so trying to get them to give you specific feedback on something you're trying to learn can become really hard because they're just like, oh my God, holograms. <laughs> and so, that's where sometimes you have to be a little bit creative and mixing both novice users and experienced users together in your studies so that you can actually get not just like the general feedback, but also something more detailed. Is there a time when one group would be better than another, say between an interaction design or an OS design versus a hardware industrial design? I mean, if the role, I think, yeah. It, if the role of what you're trying to do is accomplish something that helps them to accomplish a task, then a lot of times you need, you're really going to need those domain, ex, domain experts for that task or for that flow or for that job or goal they're trying to accomplish. In that case, you have to build in a really robust sort of boot camp on the technology and the interactions. And you might even put in interactions that are not really the ones you want, but they're easy for people to understand and interact with. That can sort of shortcut that process. There are cases where you really do want to focus on being able to enable people to quickly train up and ex get that experience. Then you really need to have that novice experience. Yeah, just to add on that a little bit. Um, a lot of times, people who work with user researchers can get kind of annoyed at us because we say it depends so much, but it really depends. Um, if your research is looking at like, how intuitive is an interaction? I, I want someone who like has never seen this before, or someone who maybe has and is going to have to like relearn how to do this technology, right? And so, someone's lived experiences can really affect how they interact with or approach uh, an interaction or a screen or a visualization, and that can have such a large effect. So the answer there, uh, unfortunately, is it depends on so many factors. <laughs> but um, I really like you know Travis's point of like. When you're talking about experts, you also have a slim group of people to sample from sometimes, and that's a, we have to make the business understanding and business choice of like, I have 50 people in the world who I have contact with that are experts in this. Eventually, they're all going to be used to this device, so like, I don't need so many shots at like novice interactions, uh, and so those are the things that we have to take into account and really plan out carefully when we're doing the research. You mentioned people being frustrated with researchers. That's a slippery slope. We won't be entertaining questions on that. But if there are any questions, yeah, jump up. And I was curious about design. So do you guys also turn into designer during the research process? And how do you involve that department, that knowledge into this process in terms of communicating or handing over or doing research. So how does that part play a role uh, in the design of the experience you're working on? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think oftentimes the user research team is kind of embedded with the, very embedded with the design teams. Um, and it's very much an ongoing process. If, if anyone's heard of like the double diamond, which is a little bit outdated, but um, sort of going working with designers throughout the whole process from discovery um, through defining what your solution can look like um, and then testing it and doing that very closely together with, with the designers every step of the way. Yeah, I would want to even go further and say that we partner very, very closely with not just design partners but also with our engineering, product planning partners and you know, marketing and commercialization folks as, as well. Like we try to be as cross-disciplinary as possible, and especially when you start with building hardware, uh, because oftentimes what happens is research takes time. And 
often teams have questions, they come to you, they need an answer really, really quickly. But if you're embedded with the team and you are kind of in that day-to-day -day process of planning out uh, what's gonna, what needs to be done, you, under, you start getting those questions in advance. And then by the time the team comes to you with a question, you already have answers or you're getting close to getting those answers. So that's the best and most efficient way to leverage user research is just be part of the team all the way through. I add one one more thing here is that um, the UX. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, the, the the timing where UX research comes in uh, actually always comes from the very beginning. It's not the end. It's not the icing on the cake. It's actually most impactful when it starts with day one or even day zero before we decide what to make. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the times the UX research will feed into the technical and engineering choices based on the human capabilities, such as, you know, if I want to decide what kind of haptics uh, actuators I want to put in there, I have to consider the perceptual capabilities of humans. And that needs to go from day one or day zero. Yeah. Great. Well, first of all, thank you for a great panel. My name is Joe Cap. I'm one of the co-founders of LGBT Tech. We're a nonprofit that looks at the intersection of LGBT communities, marginalized communities. And one of the biggest concerns that we have, there's a couple, one of the great things about um, this technology is it allows people to go ahead and present themselves in a way that they choose. Uh, but one of the other problems or challenges that we have are how um, this technology can be used for bullying and also how um, the data and the underlying data may be used by um, uh, maybe bad actors who are targeting um, uh, LGBT communities and other marginalized communities. So I'm just curious, uh, as you go through the value of the research and the user experiences, how do you take into account um, maybe communities that are smaller and more niche in nature but have a definite um, potential harm that can be caused as we continue to go build out these technologies? So, um, you know, I can only speak for our group, but I know that it is a huge, huge problem. It's, first of all, a great question. And secondly, it's a huge problem and it's a huge issue uh, that needs to be addressed and tackled because, you know, as we all seen people online, like when you feel like you're behind the screen, you're away from people, you're like semi-anonymous, like often you see like the worst come out in people and they start, you know, acting like trolls and bullying and just, you know, being very, very harmful. And I think there's a lot of conversation right now in this space, in the augmented reality, uh, virtual reality space about how to tackle that as a community, not just like as an each individual company, but as, as a community all up to make sure that there's guidelines in place, there's ways that we can understand um, bad behaviors and prevent them, stop them, and also promote good behaviors. So I would say that you know, one of, from the research standpoint, one of the ways you can do it is you involve underrepresented communities in your product development, in your research, you get their opinions, you get their feedback, and you understand which pain points and which issues are much more uh, prevalent to them or important to them uh, than they would be to kind of like a majority user. And, um, you know, that's a strong commitment that the teams would make to make sure that they engage with those groups. Um, that would be, yeah. Yeah, representation in your sampling during research projects certainly is, is the, the root of, you know, understanding it and designing for it. Oh, who, who, who adjusted the height of that? Hi, my name is Elizabeth. Uh, I investigate AR for education. And one of the issues that we've always been having is the current devices or current SDKs when using them, especially with children, they end up, oh, now the tracking's not working. Oh, now this isn't happening, and X, Y, Z bug thing happens, and everything you're trying to test, you can't really get to because your main limitation is some software technical difficulties. So do you feel that this is something that needs to be advanced within hardware, within software, within both, and how can we get that user experience um, up to a level where we can actually start testing like real um, education AR, or other type of like benefits that you can have in AR so you don't have you don't have like studies that are inconclusive and someone can change it just because, oh, there's different user experiences that they have. Sounds like you have experience pilot testing with prototypes. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's our world. Uh, Jen, I think you might be. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, yeah we beat um, education technologies a lot for very young kids, preschool kids. Some of them have um, 
special needs, like children with autism or children who are deaf and hard of hearing. So I guess there are um, like various levels of expectation of user experiences. For example, if you are you know, in the early stage of an innovative piece of technology and you really want to test out like the alignment of the technology in supporting certain cognitive or behavioral challenges for the user, then you might, you know, may not have you know the bandwidth to make sure every single pieces that work perfectly but as long as the the, the part that uh, um, that you want to utilize to tackle the specific um, scaffolding with learning works then that's just kind of like a very small scale control study um, usually with that is more like a sandbox so you just basically as long as the, the system works um, robust enough for the experiment purpose that will be fine but I totally understand your concern was because there are so many moving pieces in terms of you know XR technologies right the tracking the the sound and the, the the human factor, all those like add up uh, like the, the holistic experiences. My experience, I think, uh, probably not you know generalized to other uh, domains, but in terms of education, uh, from the the study we run, we actually found that students getting really into those technologies, even when things does not work. We feel that, well, of course, we have researchers around, we can explain to them, and they find that like being able to understand why things work and why things doesn't work is kind of like also a, a part of the learning experience. Of course, you know, we have the theory of like frustration-based learning. Um, but I, I totally understand like how to make how to make all this, the, the component to work smoothly. But maybe I don't know, like Travis worked on hardware. Have any comments on that? Yeah, the only thing I would add is just generally know what you think the key variables are. And I think it's exactly what you were saying. Cut out the stuff you don't need. Because it might be cool to use the controllers and stuff, and but if a mouse button or a, a Bluetooth mouse will work just fine, do that. You know, go and, and simplify and cut it down to the variables you need. Yeah, Thank you. And, and one more thing is just expect everything to break. <laughs> have, have, have a second set up ready to go. And... Um, have an extra pair of hands to fix something when it does break so you can keep going, right? There's nothing worse than having to try and like troubleshoot a problem halfway through a study. Um, yeah. Even if that person doesn't do anything, then you can just go to your engineering team and say like, thank you, good job, that was great. We didn't have any problems this time. <laughs> and you get better data because you have two people watching instead of one. So um, that would be my like couple quick tips. <laughs> Yeah, to Denny's analogy with uh, building the plane while flying it, <laughs> we just have a few parachutes in our backpack. <laughs> yeah, if you wait for a finished product to understand and research the user experience, you're going to be so far behind. Uh, it's, it's not really doable. Thank you. Um, Lindsay Hoover, I'm a co-founder of Immersive Worlds. We have a, a software metaverse platform focusing initially on behavioral health. Nothing to do with the questions I'm going to ask, though, at least per se. <laughs> two, two questions, really different, so feel free, anyone, to chime in on either of them, because I think they might be both of interest to the audience. The first is, in terms of avatars, there's the theory, at least kind of healthcare-driven, that the more you identify with your avatar and the Proteus effect of Stanford, the more you're going to align your behavior with that avatar and relate to it. And then there's what we heard from Unity this morning, which is, you know, we want all kinds of different avatars for whatever different experience that we, you know, might want to undertake. Curious what your research experience has been in that regard with users. And then secondly, the question that I think is going to be super fun to hear is, what absolutely has floored you about this that you absolutely never expected? And I mean a thing where you went, oh my god, this, from the user experience perspective. Not, not that we thought it might happen, the one where you just went, oh my god, this is what people want to do, or this is what they like or don't like. Um, I can sit down for the answers. Well, maybe I'll jump to the second question first, because uh, for us it was just really, really striking. And it's that when we first built, you know, the original Hollands and put it out and people are starting to try it, that everybody really, really wanted to touch a hologram. Just like it was completely irresistible. Everybody was just going, can I, can I just touch this? And it, you couldn't do it with the, at, at the beginning. It wasn't possible. So when that technology came into play and you were actually able to grab and move holograms around with your hand, that was an absolutely magical experience for people. Yeah, second on that one. 
I got to be a part of some of the studies towards the end of that exploration and just like seeing people's eyes light up when they touch a hologram for the first time or doing like the demo at um, uh, World Mobile Congress when we announced it, like people just walked away amazed. Um, that's like the next gen, that was really cool. To your first question about avatars, um, the user is always right in some sense. Um, so if they wanna look professional, because they're in a work setting, then like enabling them to do so. Um, if they wanna look in a different way in a social setting, you know, enabling that. Um, you know, making sure people feel, feel they are represented. Not that they look the same necessarily, right? Like, we all understand the technology limitations of where we are today um, and how to show avatars, but understanding the people can feel represented through the customization options or what they look like or these other things and identify with that person that they see on the screen representing them, um, that's, that's where you get user love. Yeah, I think just uh, for the audience, Proteus Effect is basically, it's a theory that says uh, the way that a person is represented as an avatar influences the way that they behave and the way that they feel. So like a person represented as a tall avatar will actually end up behaving and feeling more confident. Um, I think, yes, while that, that, that's interesting and important, it, it all depends, again, what um, Tom's saying, what the user wants. Um, there's no right answer. It depends on, on the situation, I think. It's a great question. Yeah, I do think that the question you alluded to, and maybe that ties to the earlier question around harms for harmful behavior, is that if folks are more closely represented to who they like are in real world, in, in real world, that will be more of a deterrent for them to act in a way that is uh, like protects them because they are not themselves. But I think we don't really know the answer to how much effect that would have yet. I think the jury is still out. There's definitely more research needed in this space. And you know, and again, like sometimes doing like yes, maybe you can force people to act more like themselves in real life, but also you are then limiting in some ways the experience of who they want to be and how they want to be represented in places. So it's a double-edged sword. Uh, hello. Um, so I work for Scope AR, and we do uh, we have a content creation platform uh, and distribution for customers that have a lot of success with like creating training programs and for like manufacturing. Um, but we're a small company, and you're all like trillion dollar companies. Do you have any recommendations for you know startups our size who are really trying to advance a lot of these use cases in AR and don't necessarily have the the funds? You have some of the stuff trickles through like MRTK and, and we can glean from there, but like, you know, how do we take advantage of some of the learning that you've been acquiring over the, you know, past decade? One thing is come to places like this uh, where we'll talk about it, um, with the part that we do talk about. Um, I think it doesn't matter how small an org is, if you have people who are focusing on research and you're making an effort to get outside of yourselves and bring in some of your target audience and test your assumptions, then you're going to be able to reap probably 70% of the benefit that you can get from having a, a larger, more well-oiled org um, if you're developing software. Hardware is obviously a lot more complicated in that regard, but um, I think anyone can do those things. And then I think the other part of it is um, learn from the mistakes that other companies are making. Um, you'll see people Do you reverse publish those. Well, you'll see reversals, of course. Um, you know, maybe everybody doubles down on the on widget A, and then in V2, widget A is suddenly not the thing we talk about anymore. Um, there's usually a reason for that, um, and I, I think you can also take some signal from those things. I would say to kind of maybe add to what Travis just said in terms of like doing research on the cheap, right? Is uh, if you have a specific use case that you think, like a specific user in mind, a specific target for what your pro your product is going to do, find partners. So, you know, reach out to companies in your area that are doing similar stuff. Ask them if they want to partner with you. And then you have feedback from people who would be your test users. And it's a lot better than in a lot of ways trying to figure out yourself whether or not your user will be uh, happy with what you're building. And as Travis said, hardware is a separate issue, but there are avenues, there are, there are uh, services 
where you can do online testing, whether it's wireframes or just general uh, experiences, that you can get a large number of responses. Um, it's not necessarily cheap, but you can get a lot of data, real data back um, by leveraging those instead of conducting a lot of that in person. For mixed reality, they have these platforms? Uh, if you can present it in 2D okay. uh, for what you're trying to get after, I mean, there's web-based services that right, could right. be very valuable. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, just, just to follow up there really quickly, the, you know, the, it's, you can simplify 3D into 2D fairly easily with some drawing tricks and some images. Um, doesn't have to be in 3D to get a first look. Um, being in 3D changes the feedback 100% and, and gains you that extra level. But if you're like, hey, we have 15 ideas, we don't know what to do, and you don't have time to build 15 things in 3D, then, then you know, doing a first pass at some sort of visualization is better than just choosing one. Um, so. Yeah, and because of the pandemic, there's a lot of research has been forced to move online um, during the time. And one thing you can think about is the like, uh, can making the first person perspective recording. So like, even it's almost like a tele uh, presence. Like even though the user like, do not have to come out of the way to try out the, the, the system. So it's not like a you know like a, a high fidelity experience. But at least uh, if it's early prototype and you have several versions that you just want to quickly get some feedback, just do some you know like a demo version as if this is what like approximate what the user is going to be experience. Put it online, create it like a survey with those demo videos. I think that can to some extent get uh, early feedback. I just want to add one more tip is that actually we're doing a lot of VR testing these days because of COVID and it's to totally doable to do it on uh, user testing platforms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would second the VR, but one other thing, sorry, just geek out on this kind of thing. So just know that the probably the first generation of research you're doing on any of these experiences, no matter what the size of the company is, it probably looks a lot like what you would do in any size company. And so we're talking about putting things into the world and making them look real. Well, guess what? You can put those things in the world and actually have them real. If you're going to have something pop up over here, you can put a sign up over here. You can do things that simulate complex experiences in relatively simple ways. And that looks the same everywhere when you're, when you're doing initial ideation. Thank you. The clock is at zero here. I think we have time for one or two more. 15? Okay. Hey, Oscar Castillo, Northrop Grumman. Uh, as an implementer of these types of technologies, uh, I really want to, you know, put put to use the best practices uh, in, um, in in UX that, that that's happening and emerging right now. And I, sorry if this is a little repetitive in the previous question, uh, where, where that budget might be small in terms of, um, you know, inside of that company, our, our company might it might be non-existent, right? So I'm I'm implementing technologies that are being developed, software that's being developed, so. The panel started with a de with a description of a community, right? It's a big collection of, of people from different companies. Um, if if the if the UX research that you're doing, it sounds like it's not coalescing into like a a, a group thought. Uh, do do you expect that to happen in the future? Is that something that 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 could that our company like ours could take advantage of in the future? So um, for us, uh, just a quick answer since we're over low time, uh, we're trying to always put the best practices that we learn for both interaction and UX into our guidelines for developers. So MR2K, the mixed reality toolkit that's available for building uh, on Microsoft platforms, also has uh, guidelines. They're still, you know, we're learning as we go, so we're, it's going to be updatable and, you know, evolving as technology evolves. But those are the places where you should find the collected knowledge of how people should interact through those platforms. 100% agree. I think what, what you know, Jen is working in, in academia. I mean, we're publishing work is, is the livelihood, and that, so you'll see more of it there. And then small plug for Joel, even presenting at another conference later this year on content placement within VR. So more of that work will be coming out as, as the industry grows, and, and you will be able to leverage published data. Yeah, I sort of like to think of it as, a, you know, like we're explorers in, in the, like exploring the new world, and, and we're building a map and we don't have the map yet. Um, and there's monsters in all corners, but we're, we're kind of building it as we go um, with research. Um, and, and that map is like, are the developer guidelines um, that, that we're slowly putting out there. Yeah, and, and one more thing, it, particularly as we look at like interactions, if you look across different um, devices uh, and see trends in those, 
you can see where ideas have kind of meshed together into similar form, like formats of input, formats of interaction. Um, that's a pretty good pointer to uh, to what is working for those for those groups. I'm told we have time for one more. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Dave Alpert. I'm CEO of a SaaS company, GeoPogo, for design and construction. And so we can do our user research for software, but in order for our users to experience our product, they need to use hardware. And I know all of your companies have hardware among your products. And so I'm really curious about how you do your user research. We can uh, update our software in an ongoing basis, but you have to like go from the ML1 to the ML2 and how did the user research show up in your product? How do, how, how do you distill it to, okay, this is what we're going to build in this product? Danny's giving a talk on this later today or tomorrow. Yeah. 255, ballroom EF. <laughs> to go not the magic leap route. Uh, yeah. uh, from, from other routes, um, it's often a collaboration still. You're mm -hmm. still talking to, um, you're de determining user needs at the base, and you're defining that target group, and you say, this is the target group. What do they need to do? What are the pain points we're trying to address? And from that standpoint, you then work with the developers of the experiences and the hardware uh, engineers and the ID team and determine how can what we design fit within the scenarios of use, address the pain points that these users have, and ensure that it meets all of those things. Um, some of the testing, again, may go down to what Travis was talking about and just mocking up some signs that look like whatever it needs to look like in the world and, and using that, ideally, not in a live construction environment, um, but maybe one that looks like it is, or videos of things that you can mock up. Um, you know, um, you've got uh, 3D printing. It's a great tool when it comes to physical things and testing form factors, things of that nature as well. Um, but you're not necessarily dealing with, with working prototypes in that case. So in, in that instance, ensuring that you're it, describing both a form factor and an experience within each other, that can help to ensure you're getting the full scope of, of the story there. I guess I, I was hoping for some specifics, like the whole lens one to the whole lens two, the ML one to the ML two. Um, I understand how in general you do user, user research but how did you distill exactly what you want to put in that product? Because you have to put some things in and leave some things out. Well, it just ends up being a game of prioritization. So we identify, you know, when you put out a product into market and you start getting feedback of all the things you didn't quite get right or all things you knew you weren't going to make in the first round, but then the technology advances and you can make improvements, uh, you end up with a prioritized list of, like, here's the things that people really want to do. You know, for example, better hand tracking was a big one, big jump from Pearl Lens 1 to Hull Lens 2. And um, that's what, um, you know, that's how you prioritize. So, yeah. So we can finish the way we started with Tom saying, it depends. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, I think that's it for us. I think in yep. the future, going forward, this is a topic that will be shared more. And pioneers like these in the industry uh, really have the potential to define, um, you know, what this space will be going forward, so definitely look out for these guys.